Okay, now, how many planets? Now, usually on the Kabbalah, right, what's known as the so-called Jewish today Kabbalah, this one here, you see that Saturn is often left out. So what we have, let's count it from the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right now, this ten. All right, this ten. Let's count it one more time. Ten, but we didn't count this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there's eleven. Have you noticed they say, is it the 12th planet? The 12th planet, Zachariah Sitchin, the Anunnaki, right? Bred and bred human beings. Well, that's, uh, that is inaccurate. Bred a certain species, right? Bred a certain species, a certain gene, a certain gene pool, right? That's why when they talk about those who are the 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 one percent, the ninety nine percent, the one percent. Isn't that interesting? That one percent is ruling ninety nine percent. They must get a little help from their friends or from the the their breeders, right? But the point is, they say twelfth planet or tenth planet. How have they skipped over the eleventh planet? Right, or what would be in the space of the 11th planet. Could you really consider the moon a planet? Is the moon really considered a planet planet? That's, that's a question right there. They said Pluto is no longer a planet, so are they trying to change uh, um, laws and times? They're saying Pluto is not really a real planet because of its size or so forth and so on. But notice they say Nibiru. Now, Nibiru, right, by definition, right, has an important meaning in that language of the first place mentioned in the Bible, Ethiopia, which today, on the all socioeconomic indicators and so forth and so on, is one of the last nations, right? They say very poor nation. Oh, Ethiopia is so poor. And by Ethiopia by extension, we're saying black people. Now, notice how they called the planet at first. At first, they called it a planet. Now, they call it a star. There's a big difference between a star, right, and a planet. There's a big difference between a black planet. You remember the um, public enemy? My public enemy basically spoke about what? Public enemy spoke about fear of a black planet. So after they call it a black planet, immediately they said, we got to change that name. Why? Because black folks, some black folks picked up on that and said, how interesting, they're afraid of black people here, and they're afraid of a black planet out there. They're just afraid of the, afraid of the black, right? So quickly they changed the name from uh, black planet, right, to brown dwarf. Most people hear North Pole. They think of Santa Claus. And while he'll always be at the very top of the world... There's also a magnetic pole, which is produced by um, fluctuations or flow of, of iron in the core of the Earth. Dr. Chris Conner of USF explains that the constantly moving molten iron acts like a giant car alternator, creating a magnetism on a planetary scale with a magnetic north and South Pole. But over the last few decades, it's been moving, and now it's moved all the way from northern Canada into northern Siberia. Shore of Oahu is being invaded by something strange from sea that even has sand crabs running for cover. First time I've seen this, I've never seen it before. It's really weird. It's, um, it almost looks like you want to eat it, like a little berry. It's probably millions, I'd say. If you look closely, the entire shoreline is dotted with tiny purple creatures all curled up. Looks like it has about six legs on each side. Yeah, it's like an avatar crab. Something strange comes up like this. You don't know what to expect. Eh? Maybe it's tsunami stuff. <laughs> it's something many have never seen before. A man in Texas claims he has captured the mythical chupacabra. As legend goes, the chupacabra goes after livestock, specifically sucking the blood of goats and cows. 
No cold hard evidence has ever surfaced proving the chupacabra does indeed exist, despite sightings in numerous parts of the U.S. and Latin America. Now that the suspected chupacabra in Texas has been caught, many residents in Radcliffe are getting very close views of the creature, and most of them agree, it looks like the real thing. One local, Arlen Parma, commented, I hunted coons for 20 years with dogs and I ain't never seen anything that looked like that right there. The creature has huge claws, a hairless back, a nasty growl, and tons of sharp teeth. Wildlife experts who have gotten a glimpse of the animal shut down the chupacabra rumors. One said he thought the Radcliffe creature resembled a small dog, coyote, or fox. Jackie Stock and her husband Bubba are responsible for locating and capturing the animal. They're also hoping to learn if the animal they're caring for is in Chupacabra. Oh my god. Where is he going? Hundreds of giant aliens unearthed near an African village. Upon the discovery, village elders urged the people to flee and some women fled clutching their infants. There's pictures here. But the African find is only the latest in a string of alien body discoveries stretching back some 70 years. China's strange alien bodies, it seems, if anthropologists and archaeologists dig hard enough, deep enough, and long enough, sooner or later alien bodies will surface. And 1937 was a banner year for alien corpse in China. That was the year several scrawny alien cadavers were allegedly discovered. All had huge heads and buried in caves nearby were mysterious disks that came to be called Droppa. Drop of stones. I'm looking at these pictures while I'm trying to read. Fast forwarding several decades, archaeologists breaking into a small pyramid in Egypt claim to have found a giant alien like humanoid. Unlike most ancient Egyptians, the cadaver was not mummified, had no ears or nose, a very wide mouth, and no discernible tongue. Such a body may be explained as being an alien. Or could it have been a giant slave buried alive with his tongue cut out, as Egyptians were known to do when a slave's master or mistress died? And there the answer might lie, except for the testimony of those that discovered the tomb where the remains were found. They claimed strange artifacts littered the floor of the burial chamber. Among the relics, the team also found a burnished disc of unknown metal engraved with unknown symbols not expected Egyptian hieroglyphics. They also retrieved small stone tablets depicting pictograms of stars, planets, and bizarre machines. My goodness. The corpse were not wrapped nor dressed in the traditional Egyptian burial shroud or garb, but was clothed in an odd metallic tunic. Its feet were adorned with shoes or slippers that had the look and feel similar to vinyl. The tomb itself was odd. The stones to the entrance had to be smashed apart by the team because the rock was fused and melted. Inside the eerie burial chamber, the interior walls seemed polished and partly covered with thin hanging sheets of a substance having the consistency of lead. I'll post this link so you can go back and look at all this stuff. Years later, far from Egypt, Turkish almost tripped over a weird cadaver while exploring a remote mountain cavern. A partially mummified pygmy alien, alien. Police were notified, but they determined if murder was involved, the foul play took place thousands of years before the cave explorers happened upon the fragile body. Later, forensic experts in Istanbul dated the remains to the last Ice Age. More curious than the mummified remains of the pygmy ice man, the corpse was no taller than three and a half feet during life. That was the bizarre resting place where the group of explorers found body. A heavy, oddly shaped casket said to be composed of some sparkling crystal-like materials. Pathologists that studied the corpse agreed it appeared humanoid and was not a species of ape. Well, all the facial features were similar to a human except for one shocking variation. Its eyes were three times larger 
than a normal human's eyes. The creature's pupils also resembled a reptile's more than a mammal's eyes and were all amazed that the body showed so little signs of decay. Man, check it all out. African aliens' mass grave discovery caused stunning. Back in Africa, as many as 40 mass graves were reportedly discovered at the dig, the large clay pits contained hundreds of well-preserved cadavers. Supposedly, the remains of the unworldly creatures were tall, measuring as much as seven feet and more in length. But despite the size of the creature's legs, arms, and torso, their heads were described as huge and distinctly dis inappropriate compared to their bodies. Allegedly, the partly mummified remains of the emetic creatures showed no evidence of normal human facial features. One of the scientists' team called the discovery momentous and stunning. Intense exploration of the region around the alien cemetery did not reveal the slightest trace of any anomaly artifacts or the telltale remains of of an ancient damaged spacecraft. Despite their future to discover any other hard evidence, the team believes it's possible the humanoids were crew members aboard a large alien vessel that crashed or became incapacitated. They suspect that gradually the crew succumbed to common earthborne diseases. Who buried the last of the alleged aliens is unknown. Like so many other things about
but whatever it is, it's highly intelligent, whoever they are and wherever they've come from, and they are profoundly, in our system of thinking, they are profoundly evil. They don't seem, whoever these entities are, <clears throat> they do not seem to care a damn about the human race. They oh, care not only at all. For not about life or death, no, no more than uh, they, we would care about uh, ants. That's it. And so I think that there's something going on. There are on. at least 15 types of gray aliens. The star system called Zeta Reticulum has an advanced species that you've probably heard of from Nancy Leader. She has a website called Zetatalk.com, and she tells us what's going to happen next in this pole shift. The poles don't actually shift. The crust shifts, and it changes the position of north and south relative to the Earth's crust. So that's what we're going to get, a quick shift in the crust on the surface of the Earth. What's north will not be north anymore. What's west will not be west. I've been reading her page for years, and she said that Indonesia will sink 80 feet, and Indonesia is sinking. Only the government there isn't telling the people the truth, and they are calling it flooding due to rain. But actually, Jakarta is sinking, and motorcycles are riding in water, knee and the Saurians rank pretty high. Making allies is one of the things that we can do, but maybe we don't have to do anything because some humans have already done it. They gave up the copper, the water, the air, and hundreds of thousands of us in exchange for technology to build powerful weapons, which might have been used on the World Trade Center buildings, because they came down a little too easily and some of us don't think that jet fuel melts jet engines and it isn't possible that it melted construction steel embedded in concrete either. If we have a government that kills our people and makes trades of technology for human beings I don't think we should trust them anymore, do you? We know that some of those humans were eaten by carnivorous aliens at Dulce. Thomas Costello brought us this very important information. They have a taste for children, and they like to make them very afraid before they tear them apart because they want adrenaline in the blood. It's like an aphrodisiac. I have the feeling that Lacerda's people eat humans too. She hinted at it, and after 65 million years, I think they could have developed a taste for humans. I would take her advice and not stray into her camps. If someone delivered a free pizza to your door, would you eat? I don't want to be anybody's pepperoni, do you? The history of Mesoamerica includes the Aztecas, the Mayan, and the Incas. And they practiced human sacrifice for the gods. And if you look at the gods, they're reptiles. Were these reptiles from Earth or somewhere else? Were they eating humans as meat? We know that the Mayans built pyramids, and we know they were cannibals before we arrived. We brought them Jesus and made them stop eating one another, but we killed 25 million of them in the process. So how much good did we do the indigenous people of Mesoamerica? I'm curious now who the serpent people were who influenced the Mayans and gave them their skills in astronomy and mathematics. They know a lot, and they don't vary much from us. Not enough to have done this on their own. Someone had to help them, I surmise. I will have to go back and reread everything I have read on the Mayans, Incas, and the Azteca. The gods that they worshipped were reptiles from Earth, maybe. Lacerda said that they have this special ability to make you think you see a human being and so you're not afraid. They can get very close to you and then attack. It might be like being eaten by a large snake, and I don't want to be eaten by any reptile. We know that snakes eat mice, rabbits, and deer, so they already have a taste for mammals, and this makes me very suspicious of them in respect to cuisine. Also, I saw some reptiles chase a Russian soldier down and pull his arms off and eat him. Those creatures looked a lot like Lacerda. They drank his blood like savages, and they ate his flesh. Look up these two words on Google, Russian and zombies. It's shot with night vision goggles, and you can see the heat of the poor guy's blood as they yank his arms and legs off, too. One guy in the helicopter vomits in fear. That's real enough to me. The Russian soldier lost his life, and he had a machine gun. I don't have any gun, so what chance do I have? I want to sue for peace. The Pleiadians told us that there are 1.5 million ships around the Earth now, 
and that they are here to help us with our ascension to fourth and fifth density. We know that recently some of the underground alien bases were destroyed. I wonder if Lacerda's group was affected by this, and I hope their homes were not destroyed. Not because they eat us, but because they are more advanced, and we need a big brother right now. If the Galactic Federation is the Elohim, and they have returned to finish the war with the Terransarians, then I side with the Terrans, and I do not want to be part of any group that invades a planet 65 light years away and starts turning monkeys into intelligent creatures which make nuclear weapons and claim the Earth as their own when there is a species here to consider. The species of reptiles which have 65 million years of gradual development in order to become sapiens should be respected, not opposed. We should ally with them for our own survival, because I don't see us surviving if the Elohim just extincts their genetic experiment when they're tired of playing in the lab. If the Sorens were belligerent, they could have destroyed us over the past 8,500 years at any time. When the Elohim left, they could have wiped us out, but they didn't. They hide from us and do not seem to want trouble, even though they resent our existence and I feel more comfortable with them, even if we're on their menu, rather than the genetic manipulators who trash the previous experiments when they are done with them, as if the life forms were no more valuable than lab rats. One last thing. I looked up the Aldebaran, which means in uh, Arabic, the follower, and found uh, Aldebaran right next to the Orion constellation. It's in the Taurus constellation right next to Orion. And I want to show you a map of it so you know where it is. The star is 65 light years away from us, and the star is a giant like Betelgeuse and Rigel in the Orion constellation. Learning the sky is important now because that's going to be our new home. We are going to travel the stars from here on out, but only if we survive. One of the things that's vital to our survival is to be part of a large organization, a federation, which has some rules that protect us and protect our sovereignty. Invaders will face the entire Federation and not just us. We'd be a pushover to someone who has advanced technology. We need allies with advanced technology also. And we need to get on the rapid track of development. And I see advanced species as the right path. How about you? Next, we don't need leaders who sell out their own kind. And these leaders must be replaced with some that care about the lab rats the Constitution, and our rights. The slavery and controls have to go. Your paycheck is yours, not the IRS. And we no longer need the Federal Reserve robbing us through inflation and fractional reserve banking, which keeps all of us in debt. So the struggle to be free rests on our ability to elect a constitutional president, and we are denied our candidate, and we have these other candidates pushed on us like the health care control bill, and I don't like that one bit. How about you? We started out talking about reptiles and humanoids from stars 65 light years away, and now we're talking about American politics. Are they related? They are related if we are being led down a path by outsiders. We, the people of the United States, must have our freedoms back, free choice, and not be subjects of a slavery system. And I suspect that the influence comes from outside. And I'm not talking about a Federal Reserve which is owned mostly by foreigners either, or an IRS that's a private corporation and serves as the collection agency for the Federal Reserve. I mean outsiders from other star systems who came to Earth for their own selfish interests and don't give a rat's lab about us. The Lacerda story is important because it's information about who we are and it gives us a direction. We know now what we must do. We must have disclosure of all information about aliens so we know what we're up against. Um, it was literally all over the world, this, this phenomenon, 
especially about 2,000 years ago, but there are skulls that have been found that have been cranially deformed from the area of Iraq that go back at least 30,000 years. Um, but my, my major focus has been uh, Peru and Bolivia because this is where I spend almost all of my time and my more particular focus has been uh, the Paracas area but also up around Cusco because a lot of elongated skulls have been found there as well and so the main thing is it's trying to you know to, it's trying to trace back in time to find the original ones if possible because they would be the rootstock from which all of the others came from and it's our strong belief that the you know cranial deformation was a process in order to replicate the look mm -hmm. of someone because that was the international um, you know, if you can boil cranial deformation or elongated skulls down uh, in any culture down to three basic points, the first point was that it was believed that it made the children more attractive. Number two, it was believed it made them more intelligent. And number three, that is what the um, ancestors looked like. And cranial deformation, at least in Peru and Bolivia, was only practiced amongst the royal families. It was not... Uh, that the entire population was was this. It was only a very exclusive genetic bloodline that had this characteristic, whether ceremonial, uh, excuse me, ceremonial or through natural cause. Do you believe that they were, you know, again, with possibility here, then out of out of the Middle East, Iraq area, kind of thing, coming out of there, traveling potentially around to different parts of the world, maybe even. You know, following a certain route, maybe, you know, of course, not all of them left. They might even have spread globally in that regard. But how do you think that they were, they came from, from wherever they actually did come from over to the Paracas region, Brian? Well, that's a great question. And the thing is, even when we were, again, in the director's office of the Museum of Archaeology in Lima a few days ago, they honestly don't know where the Paracas came from, literally. I yeah. mean, uh, they, you know, they their civilization rises about 1000 BC. Uh, their artistic abilities, which were really advanced, including it's quite possible they had the potter's wheel, which no other uh, Native American group that I know of had. All of a sudden, they appear in this area, and so it's quite mysterious. And along with the fact that this royal bloodline had auburn red hair, which we've shown is genetically red. It's not dye or uh, sun bleaching or the result of age and so I'm starting to piece together a global picture of migration patterns and it's only kind of a, a gut feeling now but through co conversation with uh, with LA we've noticed uh, there's there were a lot of elongated skulls in the Middle East and also in the area of, uh, of Georgia uh, as well and so I honestly I kind of think that we're go going to find uh, a bloodline, at least one, one or, or more aspects of uh, the bloodline coming from somewhere in the Middle East. And if you study um, the wind and current patterns of the Pacific Ocean or mm -hmm. global oceans in general, then you can see that it is conceivable that ancient people could have sailed uh, from the Middle East uh, through the Pacific to, south, to the coast of South America. Right. Yeah. Now, there's a couple of pictures there, I believe, that actually you can literally see the, 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 the hair on the skull as well. Is that intact or is that, I mean, is that put on afterwards? Is that the real deal right there? No, it's intact because the thing is, uh, the Paracas area is amongst the driest places on Earth. It's actually an extension of what is called the Atacama Desert of Chile. And so Paracas gets less than one inch of rain per year. And... Um, it's all sandy area, uh, and as well, this area is uh, uplifted ancient ocean. So there's still a lot of salt in the sand itself. So in terms of preservation, it's probably even better than an area like Egypt. So textiles, uh, human skeletal parts are incredibly well preserved, and I have, you know, I've witnessed both in the museum and also in the field, where I go quite often. Uh, numerous skulls that have intact, complete um, hairstyles on them, and huh. they are this be this beautiful, unique auburn red. It's not like Irish or Scottish red hair. It's a darker, fiery color. Hmm. Interesting. It, it, when I look at it, it, it reminds me a little bit about the bog people that have been found primarily in 
you know, Denmark, England, Netherlands, I think a couple of in Sweden as well, where the head is, you know, uh, the hair is preserved rather. You can even see like the Subian knots and the hairstyle and everything else in there. It's really interesting. And a lot of them also have that, that have a red hair. Now, if it's matching that, that you're talking about, if it's a, if it's a richer one, if you will, I don't know if that's a correlation, but we can talk more about that later. But it's nonetheless very interesting. Did you, uh, LA, when you were down there, did you, uh, you know, hold one of these in your hands? Did you look at them properly? What, how did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, um, we, to say we handled them is an understatement. Um, <laughs> we, we measured, weighed, handled them, photographed them. We actually had a dentist um, from Peru come in and take a look at the dentition. Uh, we've done casting of these skulls. Um, there's a, in fact, right behind me, we have a cast of, of one of the elongated skulls. I've shown that to many doctors and dentists and uh, forensic anthropologists here. Um, we, we took a sample of just of the hair, just a very small sample uh, of the hair, and it was already, it had fallen off one particular skull. And what we wanted to do was to find out whether it was dyed or not. So we took it back to the States, and this is where it gets really strange. And there's a machine called Raman spectroscopy. And you can take um, different objects and, and put it, and what this machine will do is it will analyze whatever you're putting in it and tell you on a graph, plot it on a graph, what it's sort of made out of, its molecular structure. So what was interesting is, is we had four samples. We had a normal human hair from modernity. We had a normal human hair from present day uh, that was dyed. Okay, so that's one and two. Normal human hair, dyed human hair. We had the paracus red hair. And then number four, and this is where we, you know, not in Kansas anymore type of deal, um, <clears throat> the particular gentleman who was running this is also uh, very involved in the UFO abduction phenomena. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he was given in his possession by a man who had been abducted and forced to have sex with a hybrid being with very white blondish hair. All right? Right. So we have four hairs. We have the human hair, the dyed human hair, the red hair from Paracas, and this white hair from supposedly some sort of a hybrid being. All of them ran through Raman spectroscopy. The human hair starts about midway up the graph on the left side, does a nice little arc, and then kind of comes down. The dyed human hair starts at about the same place, but the arc is totally different. It shoots up um, to the very top in a very dramatic, uh, long arc. So they're completely different. The, the dyed hair is totally different looking in, on, on the Raman spectroscopy graph than the normal human hair. But here's where it gets really interesting. And when we saw this, um, the man who was doing a test fell out of his chair. And when he explained it to us, we promptly, promptly fell out of our chairs too. <laughs> um, when you take the Raman spectroscopy reading for the Paracas red hair and the so-called whitish hair from the, the hybrid, female hybrid being, and you plot those on a graph, they basically track almost identically with one another. The hmm. slopes are almost the same. You can juxtapose them one upon the other. That's how close they are. And that blew us away because, again, what it, what it, for us, what it does, from my particular paradigm, it brings what was happening then, thousands of years ago, in antiquity, and all of a sudden there's a leap, a scientific leap, uh, into modernity, and there seems to be a relation between the hair from the hybrid being today and, and, and you know, present day, and the red hair from Paracas. Now, look, that's not conclusive, but it's certainly absolutely mind-boggling, and once again, it sort of leads us down the road that there is an outside agency messing with the genome. Well, that is interesting. That's that's indeed very interesting. Now we could talk a little bit about um, there might be some difference that we see here in the, in the the general outlook of you know where they come from, even what the purpose of 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 them were in that regard. But if we switch back to you, Brian, to a certain extent here, do you believe that they were? We're talking about a race of that that became the king king race, if you will, because of their appearance and everything. And then we obviously have a scenario here where. Uh, you know, so-called regular Norman humans, when they dyed their hair, they, they shaped their skulls to look like these beings to kind of be, be part of that line as well. And who do you think they were? They were like the, the, the kings and the royals of, of that area? Well, they definitely were the royal family of the area because the tombs that they've been found in uh, have been 
you know, have been rich in uh, very incredible ornate tapestries, uh, fine ceramics, etc. And that's typical anywhere in the world where you find uh, royal tombs, you tend to find very nice artifacts, whereas a farmer's grave will tend to have not much in it. So we do know that they were uh, of a royal class. Uh, part of the mystery is that when the Nazca take over the area, which was about 100 AD, all of a sudden the elongated skulls disappear from the archaeological record. They're not really found that much amongst the Nazca um, tombs. And so it's my beginning of a theory that I think the Nazca in fact eradicated the royal family of the Paracas for some reason. Um, but I can't understand why you know why you wouldn't find the Paracas in the ar archaeological record uh, once the Nazca take over. However, when we look, uh, the thing is that this phenomenon existed all over uh, Peru and also in the area of uh, many parts of, of Bolivia, including Tiwanaku and um, Pumapunku and other sites in Peru where you find megalithic structures. I'm starting to find direct correlations between me megalithic building and the presence of elongated skulls. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Do you, th do you believe that they were... The Nazca people were, were were threatened to a certain extent. I mean, we, it's not something new to see, uh, you know, people in a close proximity being at a war in the in the ancient times. You know, this is just how how things were. But it might be a potential uh, turf war. They wanted to take over the region. They might even wanted to have uh, controlled some of these, um, you know, different different looking peoples, perhaps. Well, that's very true. And what we do know from uh, you know from from records is that are not necessarily records, but um, studies of what the climate was like is that around 100 AD the whole coastal area of Peru began to des become desert. It's January and so 19, that 2014. This should alarm people. It got so cold in Norway that fish that were swimming froze in place. They have an image here. Yahoo has another image. I guess because the fish were frozen in the water that the birds couldn't even feast on them. There's also been report of moose being frozen instantly in the water. You know what this reminds me of is that woolly mammoth that they found frozen. Up Um, it was literally all over the world, this, this phenomenon, especially about 2,000 years ago. But there are skulls that have been found that have been cranially deformed from the area of Iraq that go back at least 30,000 years. Um, but my, my major focus has been uh, Peru and Bolivia because this is where I spend almost all of my time. And my more particular focus has been uh, the Paracas area, but also up around Cusco, because a lot of elongated skulls have been found there as well. And so the main thing is it's trying to, you know, to, it's trying to trace back in time to find the original ones, if possible, because they would be the rootstock from which all of the others came from. And it's our strong belief that the, you know, cranial deformation was a process in order to replicate the look. Mm -hmm. of someone because that was the international um, you know if you can boil cranial deformation or elongated skulls down uh, in any culture down to three basic points the first point was that it was believed that it made the children more attractive number two it was believed it made them more intelligent and number three that is what the um, ancestors looked like. And cranial deformation, at least in Peru and Bolivia, was only practiced amongst the royal families. It was not uh, that the entire population was, was this. It was only a very exclusive genetic bloodline that had this characteristic, whether ceremonial, uh, excuse me, ceremonial or through natural cause. Do you believe that they were you know, again, with possibility here, then out of out of the Middle East, Iraq area, kind of thing, coming out of there, traveling potentially around to different parts of the world, maybe even 
you know, following a certain route. Maybe, you know, of course, not all of them left. They might even have spread globally in that regard. But how do you think that they were, they came from, from wherever they actually did come from over to the Paracas region, Brian? Well, that's a great question. And the thing is, even when we were, again, in the director's office of the Museum of Archaeology in Lima a few days ago, they honestly don't know where the Paracas came from, literally. I yeah. mean, uh, they, you know, they, their civilization rises about 1000 BC. Uh, their artistic abilities, which were really advanced, including it's quite possible they had the potter's wheel, which no other uh, Native American group that I know of had, all of a sudden they appear in this area and so it's quite mysterious and along with the fact that this royal bloodline had auburn red hair which we've shown is genetically red it's not dye or uh, sun bleaching or the result of age and so I'm starting to piece together a global picture of migration patterns and it's only kind of a, a gut feeling now but through co conversation with uh, with LA we've noticed uh, there's, there were a lot of elongated skulls in the Middle East and also in the area of, uh, of Georgia uh, as well. And so I honestly, I kind of think that we're go going to find uh, a bloodline, at least one, one or, or more aspects of uh, the bloodline coming from somewhere in the Middle East. And if you study um, the wind and current patterns of the Pacific Ocean or mm -hmm. global oceans in general, then you can see that it is conceivable that ancient people could have sailed uh, from the Middle East uh, through the Pacific to south to the coast of South America. Right. Yep. Now there's a couple of pictures there, I believe, that actually you can literally see the the the, the hair on the skull as well. Is that intact, or is that I mean, is that put on afterwards? Is that the real deal right there? No, it's intact because the thing is, uh, the Paracas area is amongst the driest places on Earth. It's actually an extension of what is called the Atacama Desert of Chile. And so Paracas gets less than one inch of rain per year. And um, it's all sandy area. Uh, and as well, this area is uh, uplifted ancient ocean. So there's still a lot of salt in the sand itself. So in terms of preservation, it's probably even better than an area like Egypt. So textiles, uh, human skeletal parts are incredibly well preserved and I have, you know, I've witnessed both in the museum and also in the field where I go quite often uh, numerous skulls that have intact complete um, hairstyles on them and huh. they are this, be this beautiful unique auburn red. It's not like Irish or Scottish red hair. It's a darker fiery color. Hmm. Interesting. It, it, when I look at it, it, it reminds me a little bit about the bog people that have been found primarily in, you know, Denmark, England, Netherlands. I think a couple of in Sweden as well, where the head is, you know, uh, the hair is preserved rather. You can even see like the Subian knots and the hairstyle and everything else in there. It's really interesting. And a lot of them also have that, that have a red hair. Now, if it's matching that, that you're talking about, if it's a, if it's a richer one, if you will, I don't know if that's a correlation, but we could talk more about that later. But it's nonetheless very interesting. Did you, uh, LA, when you were down there, did you, uh, you know, hold one of these in your hands? Did you look at them properly? What? How did? You? <laughs> yeah, that that's um, we to say we handled them is an understatement. Um, <laughs> we we measured, weighed, handled them, photographed them. We actually had a dentist um, from Peru come in and take a look at the dentition. Uh, we've done casting of these skulls. Um, there's a, in fact, right behind me. We have a cast of, of one of the elongated skulls. I've shown that to many doctors and dentists and uh, forensic anthropologists here. Um, we, we took a sample of just of the hair, just a very small sample uh, of the hair, and it was already, it had fallen off one particular skull. And what we wanted to do was to find out whether it was dyed or not. So we took it back to the States, and this is where it gets really strange. And there's a machine called Raman spectroscopy. And you can take... Um, different objects and, and put it and what this machine will do is it will analyze whatever you're putting in it and tell you on a graph, plot it on a graph, what it's sort of made out of its molecular structure. So what was interesting is, is we had four samples. We had a normal human hair from modernity. We had a normal human hair from present day uh, that was dyed. Okay. So that's one and two normal human hair, dyed human hair. We had the Paracas red hair, and then number four, and this is where we, you know, not in 
Kansas anymore type of deal. Um, <clears throat> the particular gentleman who was running this is also uh, very involved in the UFO abduction phenomena. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he was given in his possession by a man who had been abducted and forced to have sex with a hybrid being with very white, blondish hair. All right? Right. So we have four hairs. We have the human hair, the dyed human hair, the red hair from Paracas, and this white hair from supposedly some sort of a hybrid being. All of them ran through Raman spectroscopy. The human hair starts about midway up the graph on the left side, does a nice little arc, and then kind of comes down. The dyed human hair starts at about the same place, but the arc is totally different. It shoots up um, to the very top in a very dramatic, uh, long arc. So they're completely different. The, the dyed hair is totally different looking in, on, on the Raman spectroscopy graph than the normal human hair. But here's where it gets really interesting. And when we saw this, um, the man who was doing a test fell out of his chair. And when he explained it to us, we finally, promptly fell out of our chairs too. Um, when you take the Raman spectroscopy reading for the Paracas red hair and the so-called whitish hair from the, the hybrid, female hybrid being, and you plot those on a graph, they basically track almost identically with one another. The hmm. slopes are almost the same. You can juxtapose them one upon the other. That's how close they are. And that blew us away because, again, what it, what it, for us, what it does, from my particular paradigm, it brings what was happening then, thousands of years ago, in antiquity, and all of a sudden there's a leap, a scientific leap, uh, into modernity, and there seems to be a relation between the hair from the hybrid being today and, in, 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 you know, present day and the red hair from Paracas. Now, look, that's not conclusive, but it's certainly absolutely mind boggling. And once again, it sort of leads us down the road that there is an outside agency messing with the genome. Hmm. Well, that is interesting. That's, that's indeed very interesting. Now we could talk a little bit about, um, there might be some difference that we see here in the, in the, the general outlook of what, you know, where they come from, even what the purpose of, of, of them were in that regard. But if we switch back to you, Brian, to a certain extent here, do you believe that they were, we're talking about a race of the, that became the king, king race, if you will, because of their appearance and everything. And then we obviously have a scenario here where, uh, you know, so-called regular Norman humans, when they dyed their hair, they, they shaped their skulls to look like these beings to kind of be be part of that line as well. And who do you think they were? They were like the, the, the kings and the royals of, of that area? Well, they definitely were the royal family of the area because the tombs that they've been found in uh, have been, you know, have been rich in uh, very incredible ornate tapestries, uh, fine ceramics, etc. And that's typical anywhere in the world where you find uh, royal tombs, you tend to find very nice artifacts, whereas a farmer's grave will tend to have not much in it. So we do know that they were uh, of a royal class. Uh, part of the mystery is that when the Nazca take over the area, which was about 100 AD, all of a sudden the elongated skulls disappear from the archaeological record. They're not really found that much amongst the Nazca um, tombs. And so it's my beginning of a theory that I think the Nazca, in fact, eradicated the royal family of the Paracas for some reason. Um, but I can't understand why you, know, why you wouldn't find the Paracas in the ar archaeological record uh, once the Nazca take over. However, when we look, uh, the thing is that this phenomenon existed all over uh, Peru and also I in the area of uh, many parts of of Bolivia, including Tiwanaku and um, Pumapunku, and other sites in Peru where you find megalithic structures. I'm starting to find direct correlations between me megalithic building and the presence of elongated skulls. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Do you, th do you believe that they were, the Nazca people were, were, were threatened to a certain extent? I mean, we, it's not something new to see, uh, you know, people in a close prox proximity being at a war in the, in the ancient times. You know, this is just how how things were, but it might be a potential uh, turf war. They wanted to take over the region. They might even wanted to have uh, controlled some of these, um, you know, different different looking peoples, perhaps. 
Well, that's very true. And what we do know from uh, you know from from records is that are not necessarily records, but um, studies of what the climate was like is that around 100 A.D. The whole coastal area of Peru began to des become desert, and so that, of course, forced. It's strange. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. You and the audience are part of the conflict. More human beings were slaughtered in the 20th century than all previous centuries combined. We're talking a congressional record, 135 million dead. Their entire purpose was to detach our culture from any moral anchors whatsoever. You look at the changes in America since 1960, perhaps, the, the whole culture has been transformed. They're coming out of the belief that the village should raise the child. Uh, and the village means the government. They have deliberately destroyed the American family, understanding that's the foundational block that uh, builds a society. We've come from uh, Norman Rockwell's America to uh, you know, Hugh Hefner's America. If we lose the Judeo-Christian framework, we're lost forever. While the USA goes around the world expounding on the virtues of its way of life, it is obvious that those in charge place little value on human life. They are willing to kill thousands, even millions, for profit, for power, for money, for oil and resources. The USA doesn't even value the lives of its own citizens. Witness the numerous testings of weapons, drugs, medications, pesticides, GMOs, subterfuge on its own population. One of the few developed nations that fails its citizens totally in the area of the right to adequate health care, those who cannot afford it do not get it financially, mentally, and physically robbed by politicians, banksters, and industry, without the capacity to understand how to care for themselves, they end up homeless on the street, begging for money, being robbed, being beaten, being hungry, committing crimes because they have no choice. Then there are the families, the lives of these families are becoming pure hell. There is violence, destruction, and threats. An all-out attack from the health system, the government, law enforcement, and even neighbors. The state itself is ultimate. If there's nothing, no law higher than the state, and if there's no law higher than the state, there's no appeal against it. They're training them for the collective and a collective mindset and a dependency mindset. And it seems that they, again, want to have people be uneducated, so then they do become wards of the state. They're dependent on the government to provide everything for them. So, meet the mentally ill of the USA 
and the victims of the many who go without being cared for. Meet the disposable people. The political pundits and politicians have started a mantra about gun control in order to gain more control over the population. It's not the guns, stupid. It's the lack of care for your own people. It is suggested that the USA get its own house in order before dictating to the rest of the world. Use the many blessings and resources of the land, the people, for your own, and not for trotting around the globe, killing others for profit, whilst those at home suffer. The capitalist system sees people as a disposable commodity to be thrown out if not productive or useful in some way. The American dream. You have to be asleep to believe it. Once people figure it out, they're going to do what people everywhere do. They're going to start protesting and they're going to start revolting. And when that happens, that's when the powers that be feel threatened and they use the power that they have. Meet the USA's disposable people. Oil soaked and fracked. Food poisoned. Inoculated by tainted vaccines. Fukushima radiation. Trapped by mainstream media propaganda. Spied upon by government. Impoverished. Murdered. A homeless empire created by and destroyed by the U.S. military-industrialist complex. Treated like garbage. Promulgated by the same shady cast of characters responsible for embroiling us in the endless war on terror in the first place. Americans, the disposable people. Shalom.